Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and so glad you're here with us on the show. A little bit later, I'll be speaking with Chandra Heyer. She's a retired fashion model, empowering others as a medicine woman, a healer, and the owner of Tribu Spirit, Dare to Dream podcast, won the COV Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show, Walt Magazine named Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger, one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It's a high-ranking self-improvement show on Apple Podcasts and has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and for a Webby Award. Thank you to our sponsors, Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do energy work out into the world. So if you're ready to become a facilitator or just take healing classes, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I am a book writing coach. I help you go from the idea of your book to the self-published finish and create a highly engaging page turner. I also have a company that takes your book to a guaranteed international bestseller. And finally, I teach people how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts. I am a publicist and I show you how to get massive results for your time spent on air. It's time for you to book your spots. And if you would like to learn how to be more visible, I have all sorts of templates and how to's and I show you exactly how to start creating what I'm talking about for media visibility for spiritual messengers. Go to debbie-dashinger.com slash gift. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. So today I'm speaking with Chandra Heyer, who is of Cherokee Indian heritage, a medicine woman, quantum energy healer, sound therapist, and conscious entrepreneur. She's a somatic trauma integration practitioner, ascension guide, and mentor. Chandra is the founder and creator of Tribu Spirit, an online shamanic shop and Aurora Quartz Grails, providing high-frequency crystalline sound bowls and grails encoded with special codes of light. She's been working in service with sacred plants since 2010 and travels the world serving in ceremonies under her established plant medicine church, Tribu, that's T-R-I-B-U. Chandra has knowledge and experience in many different fields of healing and shamanic arts. Chandra is an Aurora Emissary of Light, a group of galactic beings here to assist in the planetary ascension. You can learn more about her by going to tribuspirit.com as well as higherconsciousness.com, and that's H-Y-R-E consciousness.com, or find her on Instagram at tribu underscore spirit. And with that, I welcome Chandra to the Dare to Dream show. It is so great to have you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Debbie. It's a, a real blessing and an honor to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. And welcome to my ceremony room. <laughs> Woohoo! I love it. I'm ready to go there and sing to tell you the truth. Create wow. some magic with you. I'd love um, to well, uh, just so I got to start there because I'm looking at these yummy, just spectacular creatures if they feel like living entities. So could you tell us a little bit about what we're looking at? Like, can we start with this gold or brass looking one? Yeah. So I don't know if you can see the, um, the artwork on it. Oh, yeah. Now yeah. I can. Yep. This is the ether artwork. <clears throat> And this is from the limited edition collection. And this one is also part of the limited edition collection. This is air. You can see the butterflies and the crystals in there. So I'll tap this one. Hopefully the sound isn't too distorted. Yeah, I'll have to turn on the uh, the music because we can't hear it. Let me try that and try that now and let's see if we can hear it. Just 
to give you a little vibrational feel. <laughs> oh, I heard a harmony in there at the end. There were wow. several notes playing at the same time at the end. Yeah, they, they resonate, resonate. And then when you play one, if you have other ones around them, they will also resonate and then create a third mm -hmm. harmonic. So this is the limited edition collection. I don't have the full one. You can find it on the website, but um, all of this magic started, I started channeling all of this, which is part of my galactic history as in Aurora, which I haven't really spoke a whole lot about. It's a lot of new information, even for me as my lineage and my Akashic of really where I am and where I'm from. And also the Auroras as galactic beings of light. Um, so the information started coming in bit by bit, like little puzzle piece by puzzle piece. And now that I have the, the full the full puzzle, um, I'm able to, to share with you in bite sizes so that we don't have this really long story. Um, essentially, so what these codes, they're, they're really alchemy of, of what, what happens and what they do. The auroras, I'll share with you, are a group of galactic beings, which I am. Uh, we are from Andromeda, from the next universe. So if you want to say we're essentially from the future, coming back to serve humanity in the Ascension. And it's because the Ascension was has been hijacked by the negative alien agenda and the cabal, as I know, lots of us probably know and have experienced and if you didn't think that i think you know the last two three years of what has happened on the planet certainly has helped others awaken into what what's really going on we're in a very galactic war and we have been for eons um the ascension so our ascension we really should be in the, in the fifth dimension on the planet um the ascension has been hijacked and I'd love to ask you if you experience this. I always ask people if you've experienced this. So to just kind of test, um, have you ever connected into like beautiful, blissful states of oneness with God, with spirit, whatever you, you know, your source consciousness connecting in like at a really high frequency and then you get pummeled down to the floor and it's like a week or sometimes a month and you're just as high as you went, you were really far down. No, <laughs> that has not happened um, to me at all. And the only time I've ever felt a bit, it's hard to say, I'm like not ripped out, but extracted from a state like that was when I did Bufo. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, a little bit of a bummer when you come back, but no, I've never had that. Why? What is, what is that where you feel? Because I felt the oneness for sure. And I've been in that blissful state and that very all that is in the very, very creator state. Yeah. But I've not had a pummel. Okay, good. What, what happens is that there's a frequency fence around the planet. So if you say that this is, this is the planet, there is a frequency fence preventing you from really accessing the higher codes of like new earth codes, new higher frequencies of light. So when you hit the frequency fence, it's say you're connecting into source consciousness, you you become one with all that is. There is like, a, because it's a frequency fence, it sends a trigger. So it will detect you and it will send a trigger to you, a frequency wave of a low vibration so that you you're not connected into that state to keep mm. you at a lower frequency and also whether it's conscious or unconscious um to really program you to think twice about entering into that state of oneness again mm. uh, th there's all sorts of implants programs dynamics that are happening out there in the etheric um well, tell me, how did you become an Aurora Emissary of Light? What's the specific work that you do? As, as an Aurora, I carry these frequencies within me. So the codes, I can explain the codes and, and what they do alchemically. 
Mm -hmm. um, you have the rainbow spectrum of light, right? Like the primary colors. And then you have the golden frequency of light, which is for really it's the Christ consciousness frequency of unconditional love. And then you have the feminine, which is the Magdalene Sophia, Christ consciousness energy. So you have the divine masculine and the divine feminine. The feminine is the copper. So you have the copper and the gold. These are both alchemical elements. And when they're bonded onto the rainbow frequency, the primary series of colors, they then birth a new frequency of light, which is coding which is all of these colors that you that you see and also within these they they're like the aurora borealis they sh they shift they're shape they're shapeshifters really they're when i've seen them appear they're they're just massive pillars of light that look like this and they shape shift in different colors and what do um, they do these frequencies what do they create in people or what do they facilitate the frequencies are really about oneness and sovereignty like to really be God sovereign and free. So when I'm in ceremony, I always call in the auroras. There are also the aurora elemental guardians that are actually the, the, the codes. These are engraved with Izzy Ivy's artwork. She's quite a, a really beautiful Australian artist. She's mm -hmm. very galactic herself and she connects with the auroras and she's been painting them. So I have her aurora elemental guardian series and they are actual beings, etheric beings, elemental guardians. So these elemental guardians are the ones that I call in to create the rainbow fence. It's like a rainbow bridge, sorry, rainbow bridge over the frequency fence so that we can access the higher codes of light, which is new information. It's all about sovereignty and, and oneness. And really, when you access it, it's, it's exactly where this turquoise piece of mine is it's in your higher heart chakra and it's just this beautiful joyful blissful it's like going back to your childlike state of creation and joy and magic that's so awesome and so would you describe them as your star family that you're in contact the auroras yeah T talk about the mission why are the auroras an important part of the ascension as I explained, because the the ascension has been hijacked, mm -hmm. we are in the process of, so that's really why the auroras have been received the call to come to anchor in the higher codes and the frequencies of light. You can connect to them through the sun. I receive information through the sun. I understand information through light, um, which I just... I just learned is something called uh, like color and light or sound synesthesia. It's like understanding information through sound or frequency, which and, and light, which is something I do. And I always thought it was just some weird thing that I did that other people. So it's a thing. Um, the, the coding. So all matter, all density, all matter is formed. And I, I received this in a really deep Wachuma ceremony that I was in. Um, the spirit of Wachuma has helped me recover a lot of my galactic history and, and information. Um, in, a, in one of those ceremonies, he was showing me how matter is formed. And there was, I was in the womb of the darkness, of the nothingness, like in, in the abyss, you know? And then there was this, beam of light that came in of impregnation and it was the the seed of of light and and life and then everything started to take shape and form and i was shown that all matter is is burst by light which is then um sound and frequency and vibration and through that we can also see backed by science of the schematics you know when you have the frequencies and they they begin to start taking shape then you've got um the it begins to form the flower of life just like we've seen in in like uh, probably basic science classes um so within the within the light is the codes light is like super packed with information uh like 
super teeny tiny little nano particles and then when you open it it's all this information so when you when i encourage everyone to go go sit out in the sun and really like don't look straight into the sun but squint and as you squint as you're sun gazing your eyes will begin to cry this is actually really good and healthy for your eyes but it activates your pineal gland and your crown chakra and you'll be able to access pure source consciousness wow. This is so interesting to me because I know exactly about what you're talking about. I've, I took a class with a very advanced person. I won't go into his story, but it's pretty incredible. And he discussed exactly what you're talking about, the sun gazing and the activation of the pineal gland and so forth. And I definitely, you know, as a singer, as somebody who I feel like my first language is music, and when I've had my galactic history done, Andromeda, Lyra, et cetera, that, you know, it's always been for me frequency and communication, like all my lifetimes. So I totally understand what you're saying. And so when you're... You might be in Aurora. How would I know that? How would you know that? So I've uncovered a lot of this. It was a lot of weird, really strange, weird, and not very pleasant ET experiences mm. um, that would take way too long to explain here in this <laughs> short hour. But I've been working with a woman. I always, I always have someone on my team that I like. That's my responsibility um, as a space holder yeah. in medicine to constantly be making sure my my energy field is clear. So I have an incredible energy worker that I work with and she she's able to tap into the Akash and because I've mm -hmm. uncovered a lot already yeah I've been looking for information and she's just taken that and then uncovered even more so I would actually like to write a book and I'll probably be asking you about it in the near future to maybe be the doula for my book oh um, beautiful <laughs> okay so two things first your name Chandra means brings the light codes, right? So are, is your way of doing that here through these beautiful bowls and the grails you've created and your shops? And is it also through the ceremonies? And is, am I missing anything? Is there other ways that you bring the light codes and that you are an emissary? Really through, through everything I do is about elevating the consciousness, helping humanity evolve. I don't like to use the word heal because heal gives this connotation that we're broken and, and we're not. We just need to remember who we are and, and clear and realign um, to, to find the inner truth. Yeah, really it's it's through, through everything I do, through the crystal chalice grails and the bowls, through tribal spirit and the healing, helping indigenous tribes, um, with the church and my ceremonial work. Yeah. yeah. And I understand that. And I, I love the fact that you've got a church because I know that's so important right now. Um, for yeah, but something that just happened a month ago. So it's like, it's fairly new and I've been working on it for about four years. Mm. And what not to do, how to do, how to structure it, how not to structure it was very, very important. Um, because they really don't want you to find the category that is the category that is 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 all about sovereignty and, and freedom. Mm. Tribu, beautiful. So you're interesting because you're an ex fashion model. You grew up in Indiana, right? You mm -hmm. come from Cherokee Indian heritage. Have you always, Chandra, been on the indigenous path, or did, was there an unusual journey that got you here? Well, being in fashion, I actually, I come from a background of, of abuse and didn't start recognizing that until I was later in my twenties until, <laughs> until, you know, being in fashion. Um, yeah, it was hard. It was, it was fast. And at one point I nearly lost my life. Um, I was addicted to cocaine. And for a very short period of time, two years, and I just went like this, mm -hmm. really lost my life and very quickly woke up. I think because I was so scared, I, I literally felt my soul slipping. Um, 
And I, I woke up and I immediately, I changed my life from, from like one week to the next. I completely cleaned my life out and started. And that's really when my healing began, which was probably when I was 24. So I was never, yeah, that was probably like some of my darkest periods. Um, but I grew up in a way that, you know, I never, I never grew up in the reservation or even with family knowing history really a whole lot of history of my Cherokee lineage I only have like one picture of my grandma and my great grandmother and she looks like a man she's just standing there very very stern like somebody you did not want to mess with um but I intuitively I always had this feeling that I knew a different way of of life like a memory that was very harmonious in nature, living on the land. Um, and I think that, that that soul desire to experience that was the, the, the guiding light, if you, if you wanna say, to help me really begin my path in, in shamanism, in modeling actually, while I was modeling. And you say you went one day, you were one way, and the next day you were a completely different person. What created that difference? I went from doing drugs and drinking alcohol and partying all the time to losing my life, like nearly losing my life. I swallowed a whole bottle of Tylen Tylenol PM mm. and I felt my, my soul slipping. And I heard it was, whether it was my higher self or a guide, uh, I heard, you better ask for help right now or you're gone. So I told my boyfriend at the time and he made me, he made me drink like everything in the hotel, <laughs> no alcohol. Um, and then I, yeah, I threw it up and I, I was fine. So I, I really, I scared myself into sobriety. I think I went to a few NA and AA meetings and then that's all it took. It was like, okay, I got the coat, I got the keys. And I just, I didn't want to be suffering anymore. And then I started my healing. I started addressing all the abuse that had happened to me in childhood. Um, this was way before I ever even found some really like plant medicines. And in New York, then I started going to shamanic circles and found, yeah, a lot of healing through, through the journey of the drum and entering into altered states of consciousness through journeying through the underworld, middle world, upper world, I'm sure you're you're working on now. And it was something that connected in for me that was very powerful and very natural. Um, I, I'd done other methods of healing and it was like, oh, it didn't quite fit. And then within the realm of shamanism and journeying through, through the drum, it just, it was instant. Wow, yeah. amazing. And your online shamanic shop, T-R-I-B-U, Tribu, like tribe, Tribu Spirit, you have said was born out of a dream you had and this passion you had for the shamanic indigenous cultures. Can you tell me about what the dream was? I was in Brazil after a really strong heartbreak and dove head first into medicines for three months. Um, and I, I had completely transformed, you know, like drinking medicine nearly every other day, three months was a lot. Um, and when I got back to London, I was living in London at that, at that time, it was, I was also at another point, like a, another sort of dark, dark night of the soul where I was incredibly depressed, like the most depressed I think I'd, I'd been level to maybe like the, the time period when I was in my twenties. And it was, I had, it was because I went so deep and I went back to London and where I was modeling and living in a city. And I was like, oh my gosh, like why am I modeling? This is so superficial. And why am I living in a city? Like all this density mm. and this energy is just so, it felt like this. And I had to dig really, really deep and I wanted to find a way where I could be a bridge for other people's healing to help them feel or experience a, like even if it was a fraction of what I experienced and it was Hape, that was beautiful sacred medicine that got me through my depression 
And it was also through me wanting to help empower the indigenous tribes and also carry on their wisdom and their, their, their knowledge. And that's when Tribal Spirit was birthed. And is Hape the same as Rape? <laughs> yeah, it's just pronounced differently. It's originally called Rome Poto. And then in Portuguese, they, they say it as Rape. Um, but I was getting flagged on certain search engines for the for the spelling of it, R-A-P-E. Ah, mm -hmm. And I also didn't like that vibration of what it felt like when you say it. Um, so I was I was the one that started spelling it with an H and always started, yeah, pronouncing it as hape. What is your favorite rape and why? Or hape? What is your favorite hape and why? The ones that we carry, I feel like they're all little babies for me in, in a way because I've built such a strong relationship with each of them. I personally work with a lot the cobra coral. It's it's like a coral color. It has kumuru mm -hmm. in it. And it's very, it's very clearing, but it's very uplifting. And that's why I love this one so much. Um, there are other ones from time to time, you know, there's, it's, it's like having an ally. Each medicine is like having an ally. And sometimes you need a stronger ally or a stronger tool. So yeah. sometimes I work with a Nukini because that one's like a really strong arrow and you just go, and it's like, it's really piercing. It pierces through everything that's really low vibration. I wanna talk about what you mean by I work with. And let me preface it by saying this. I'm curious about what is the way to, now I've certainly done rape, hape myself um, and tried many different kinds. Wow, sometimes it can be so powerful. And can we please talk about the drip that happens when you do a really powerful, let's call it a nostril ingestion. And you get that woo. And then a little bit uh, over the next minute, you get that. It's not pleasant for me, that drip. <laughs> can we talk about that for a second? <laughs> yeah, that's the medicine cleaning. When you, when it goes into the nasal cavity and up, up into here, and then it goes back in into the back of your sinus cavity back here, and then it starts to drain all the way down into your into your throat. But that at that point, it's the medicine cleaning you, and then you need to really spit it out. Like, oh, I didn't. Know. Oh, okay. About it, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm going to see Porangui this uh, weekend. You know Porangui, his music. Okay. Yeah, yeah, amazing. So I'm sure I'll be doing hape there. And so that's good to know, though I may not spit at the concert, but <laughs> I'll deal with it. Um, and so when you say you work with it, so here's why I'm asking this. Because there's someone I know who does it and has um, hape from all sorts of places all over the world. And he does it, let's say, two, three times a day, maybe four at most. But there is a couple of people I know in his world who have mentioned to me they think he's an addict because he does it. Or maybe, you know, he's been out to a meal with them and at the meal he'll take out, you know, he's got a little vial and he's got the, um, remind me the name of it, Karucha? What is it? Hurupi. Say it? Hurupi. Hurupi. Yes. Yeah, so for people who don't know, so you put just a t he puts just a tiny bit in his hand, scoops it up. One, go I do it too. Puts it in your nose and the other in your mouth, and you just toot it very quickly in. But people have mentioned, oh, we think he's an addict because why is he doing it all the time? And so I don't really have an answer for that. I actually don't have any judgment at all. But I would love to hear your point of view about what's the right way to use it? What's the right way to approach it? Is there a way that it's abusive to oneself? Or is it just beautiful that people do it one to four times a day, et cetera? Yeah, thank you for for asking that question, like how how to come to the medicine in a, in a right. A reverent way. Yeah. A sacred way. It's very important. I get asked this question a lot hmm. uh, because it's it's made with mocacho, which is tw like 26 times stronger with nicotine than you would find in regular tobacco. Mm. 
hard time to speak. Sorry. Um, it can tend to be addictive. I always tell people, I always tell people when you come to the medicine, you make sure that you're clearing your energy first, playing ceremonial music, setting up a sacred space, really coming to it in prayer and, and a reverent way. You can't do that. Like if you're at the dinner table or I've seen people I've been in the car with some, with some people, sorry. I've been in the car with some people where stopping at a stoplight and they do pop a like in two two seconds, you know, like a junkie. And you can feel the energy behind it. Like from for me, really, this medicine is arduous to make. It's made in love and prayer, and it should only be respected in that way to to Pacha Pacha. Pacha Mama. <laughs> tell maybe he wants to come on camera and he has something to say about hape gotta give him a voice inside the portal <laughs> he's an emissary too yeah he really is well that's what his name means pacha it's the it's the catchball word for for the way that they used to describe the upper middle and lower world hanan pacha hanak pacha and pacha man. <laughs> amazing well, he's welcome, should he choose to not be off camera. But okay, there's a reverence way. There's people stopping at a stoplight and they may whip out the hape and suddenly do it in a moment. And that's not, you're saying, what it was intended for? No, and when when you come to the medicine in a, in a reverent way, mm -hmm. in a ceremonial way, it will change your whole relationship with it. There won't be this like knee-jerk reaction because you're setting up an intentional start. Intention is everything. You, mm. you could just have the power of intention in your life, like say with, with gratitude, and that will drastically shift shift your life. So if you come to medicine in a, in a reverent ceremonial way, it's going to shift and change your whole relationship to the medicine. And nine times out of 10, I encourage people to do this. And then it shifts their relationship with the medicine from one of, you know, using it excessively, and then only using it reverently, making sure that they do a ceremony that they're in a quiet space. And they're, they're doing it less, you know, normal, like maybe twice a day instead of six. And thank you so much for that explanation. Received. Yeah, yeah. very clear. You mentioned that your uh, life change and your dream was born out of a Huachuma experience. And I'm actually blown away. So I've done Huachuma many times. Don't love drinking it. Thank you very much. But the end result, of course, is beautiful. The open heart experience and the sense of love and oneness and connection and all of that. It's not a psychoactive for anybody who's wondering. It's just really a heart opener. And it's really lovely to do in a group. And I'm curious because I've never on Quachuma had an experience like you're talking about. So like what happened that occurred that gave you such a profound altering experience? Sorry, what experience are you talking about? Did I? Yeah, you mentioned earlier you were talking about this experience that changed you and opened you up. It was a defining moment, like a reference point that changed your direction and who you were and what you were going to do. Mm. We need to replay, <laughs> roll back the tape. <laughs> maybe, maybe I was speaking about Wachuma, it was a Wachuma ceremony that I was in Brazil, right? Information about um, how creation is formed through mm -hmm. light and frequency and vibration. Correct. That's the one I was talking about. I mean, all my journeys with plant medicine has, has been incredibly transformational. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe you're talking about going when I was in Brazil and I had my my three month deep dive in the jungle. Yeah, that's brave. That's really brave. Well, tell me about the indigenous people for you. Tell me about 
working with the Brazilian Amazonians or any of the other indigenous tribes? Like, what is that like? Do they welcome you in as a sister? And, uh, you know, what have you gained from living amongst them or drinking with them? My, I remember my first ceremony with the Huni Queen tribe. Um, From which country? In Brazil. Okay. And standing outside in the middle of the jungle by the fire. And I'd never really seen the indigenous in pictures this way or like, so I don't have, I didn't have any reference, just like Native American indigenous people with their headdresses that were, you know, they come back this way. And I'm standing by the fire and Nina Wall walks out and really Brazilian, Brazilian indigenous tend to be quite short. So, but they, he was wearing this massively tall like headdress that was all, all the way up to here and I was just like <gasps> he was just this magnificent being that like floated out of the forest and I was like <sighs> you know so that kind of set the tone for um my first my first ceremony in my deep dive with them and they're really they're such incredibly I want to say like simple but so pure like pure in the in the sense that like they haven't been tainted by this world and you can feel the difference in them by the purity of the way that they look at life the way that they approach life um from also to their to their everyday day to days of, of what they do they gather together in in a ceremonial tribal way of every day you know to to come together and you would you would really love and appreciate this to come together like making hape is a ceremonial prayer everyone works with they call ayahuasca um oh i believe that it's uni they call it uni um everyone takes a little bit of uni and it's very different in the jungle there it's quite watered down so it's not as strong mm. and then you're you're in this like maloka and the medicine, the the tobacco is in like a really tall container, it would be like this, but taller. And then it's of course everything's done in a ceremonial, prayerful way. And then the the whole tribe, like half of them, are singing and playing songs while the medicine is going around and they're pounding the stick to to make the hape. Um, and then it's processed like this for days on end so everything is just you know it's it's slower it's more mindful and intentional in in every and it's it's through the simplicity and the the, the power of being in the jungle alone is medicine so like the jungle is just incredibly powerful and they have all these different spirits that they call in during ceremony, mm -hmm. whether it's the jiboya, which is the, the the sacred, you know, serpent, like grandmother ayahuasca, or their cosmology of, of them coming from the stars, the mm -hmm. different paths that they work with. Yeah, and that's just the Brazilian tradition. Mm -hmm. And there's there's so many other traditions that I that I've worked with and continue to work with. I really love learning from there's different aspects of each and every one of them. And then you can also see how they're interwoven, even sometimes in their, um, like in their cosmologies. I would love to do a book about this one day where you can see with the weavings. So like the Huni Queen, they have similar patterns sometimes to the Native Americans of mm. patterns of like um, beadwork and basket weaving. And throughout all indigenous tribes, you can see the similarities. So it's it's really, to me, it says that we're all one big tribe and we're just, yeah, receiving different information. And yet on the same page. Yeah. That's beautiful. That sounds really magical. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of the forest and this man. I, how tall are you, by the way? I'm 5'9". 
So you're five nine. So there's this shorter Brazilian gentleman coming up with this massive headdress that is so glorious and imposing. And the whole idea of having your ayahuasca and then beating the hape and the, the tone they said and everyone doing the music and my goodness, being in the forest, mm -hmm. in the jungle. Wow. Incredible. One day. Yeah. And I feel like you're so brave. Like, I really do. That's a big deal. You're not saying, well, I just flew out, you know, <laughs> and I had a little jaunt. I mean, you're talking about when you say you did this once for three months, that's, that's commitment that and that is really finding your path. That's when you really know it's your path. And Chandra, you've been doing these ceremonies with nature's medicine. And I'll just name some of them that I am familiar with. And then I want to talk about the ones I don't know. So there's ayahuasca, there's huachuma, there's bufo, there's psilocybin or mushrooms, there's combo, there's hape. And then you're also involved with something called changa, which I believe is ayahuasca and psilocybin. Talk about that. What is that? Why is it used? Changa is DMT and then a smoke mix. So I extract the DMT from mimosa bark, mimosa hostilis, and then it's fused onto a, a, a smoke mix. And your smoke mix can be anything, and mine has been an, an evolving recipe probably for seven, seven years. It just keeps getting, getting better. And so there's like at least 25 plants in there. But there are three different strains of ayahuasca. There's red. So um, I actually learned that my maestro didn't even know this in the jungle. So I would like to share this for others who might not know. Beautiful. That the vine colors of ayahuasca, are they play a very particular role. Their, mm. their colors do essentially what, yeah, what, what you would think. So red is for healing, white. Mm. So you've got red vine, white vine. This is the white vine is for white sorcery and magic. And then yellow is yellow, yellow vine. And this is for the heavens. So my, my chunga has three different strains of ayahuasca. There's also other things in there to help open up your heart, like bobinsana, mm. um, different dream herbs for retaining the visions. So when it's smoked, it's smoked in a bong um, and you need to take at least three, three hits and you're in. And it's really, it's highly psychedelic in a different way than Bufo because you've worked with Bufo. Yeah. Did you see anything in Bufo? Colors? Yeah. Yeah. I, I did. Um, and I did the first one, the synthetic. And the second one was the, I hate to say it because I'm such an animal person, but yes, the second one was the toad. Very, very different experiences, both of them. And which one did you prefer? The toad. Yeah. Cause it was I much deeper and much, um, it was magnificent and mm -hmm. it, it only, it only lasted, I know it's pretty normal, but it lasted 30 minutes for me. I could have, I could have hung out there for a while and enjoyed that, but yeah, it was a lot going on. I, I, it was, you know, really fast and then it was very blissful. And it was really interesting to be completely immersed in that um, experience. And at the same time, there was a lucidity that was going on that was aware of where I was and what was happening. Yeah, I've not sat with the synthetic. I'm curious, just as, like my dad is a retired engineer. So I get this like engineering scientific kind of side of me that really wants to know everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, and of course, anything that's more natural is, is going to be more resonant with and harmonious with our, with our own beings. And so what, what would somebody do Changa for? Would there be specific, um, human experiences or issues or desires of creation that somebody would align themselves to do Changa? So one of the first times I made the medicine by myself, I was really scared to make it by myself. <laughs> and sure. of course, like loving every second of it. And, infusing and did you do the red, the white or the yellow? Of all of them. 
cool. I was like, you know, making making my batch of medicine and just infusing all my love and prayers into it. And then when it came time to try the medicine, I was like, God, I hope I didn't mess it up. <laughs> I really hope I didn't. So I received the medicine and I really, I asked the medicine to show me my, my soul's purpose. And it was like so overwhelmingly and like one of the most beautiful journeys still to this day that I've ever had this the medicine showed me my highest essence of who I am on a soul level and what I'm here to do is all of this stuff you know back then it, it all has unfolded in into this um and the medicine also communicated that it's part of my path to really share this medicine as medicine. There are a lot of people that have different feelings or viewpoints on a medicine that is chemically made. It is chemically made. You have to extract the DMT out of mimosa bark, and that's a chemical process. Um, but to really give this medicine the reputation that it deserves as a healing medicine, because it is incredibly profound i've connected to a lot of my galactic star lineages um channeled i began starting to channel light language through this medicine and i call this medicine the divine cosmic mother because for me there's it's it's grandmother medicine you know it's like some people say it's smokable ayahuasca but i don't know that just it doesn't feel right for me. I, I call her the divine cosmic mother. She is the source that births all life, you know, in the, in the center of her womb, she is creation, death and rebirth. And that is what one can experience on this medicine. It's like soul, soul retrievals have happened through this medicine. Um, soul recognitions, you know, like soul, rec soul recoveries. When I say soul retrievals, um, DT traumas and healing from childhood and connection yeah with galactic sources um, people's guides people are always connecting in with their guides people uh, whether it be like ancestral guides always coming in through this medicine it's yeah it's, it's an honor to work with this medicine and how long does it last once you take it what what is the journey like well, because I'm such an alchemist, <laughs> there's a plant in there that I've added that that makes it about 40 minutes. If you're if you if you're in there for yeah, if you've taken it properly, the journey should be about 40 minutes. This most recent batch that I've made, I didn't put that in there because sometimes it tends to create headaches. Mm. Um, so normally it would be most people's chunga is like 15 or 20 minutes long. Got it. And what about Wilka? What is Wilka? I never heard of that. Wilka, have you heard of Yoko? No. Okay. Wilka is a psychoactive seed. They they come from the Andes. Um, Wilka, Yoko, the Yoko seed is a masculine seed. It's about that big. And then the feminine seed, the grandmother, she's really called the grandmother spirit, is Wilka. And she's smaller. She's maybe like a dime a dime or a nickel size. Um, this is another very arduous snuff that is made. You have to roast, so it's a seed. You have to roast the seeds, peel the, the bark off of the seeds and then pound, pound it into a fine powder with lime powder and then mix it with a little bit of different ash. And then you administer it the same way like you would as, as hape. But most traditionally, they do it tw two. This is where you find traditional um, pipes that are shaped like this. The, the two, where it goes like this, and then in your in your mouth, that's where this originates from, from Yoko or Wilka, and it's it's been used in the Andes, um, and it's it contains five MAO, um, mild traces. So. You really have to use like one gram to have a journey and it's not very pleasant because of the lime powder and the way that it's processed and, and made it's a bit rough in the nose um but it it's then psychoactive and you begin having visuals 
in Wachuma, so I'm also uh, trained in Wachumera, and in Wachuma ceremonies, it's kind of like a secret, I'm giving away. <laughs> um, we would work with Wilka, and this is a, a very old traditional way to work when you're in a Wachuma ceremony to really then bring in the visions. Speaking of visions, there's also something you work with called Sananga. And I understand mm -hmm. that that's this powerful eye medicine that's used to sharpen night vision. Why would you use Sananga? How do you use Sananga? Sananga is a non-psychoactive eye drop. Hmm. It burns like you're dumping chili sauce in your eyes. Arr, that does not sound pleasant. Be prepared for that. <laughs> um, the Nanga is traditionally used as a hunter's medicine, so they would work with it in ceremony before they would go out for a hunt and intentionally, you know, pray to for, for, to have the animal reveal itself. <clears throat> Sananga helps, it contains uh, like 10% ibogaine, iboga, the iboga alkaloid. So it's it's really powerful for addictions, any kind of addiction under the sun. Um, because it contains iboga. And then it helps with the, so physically it helps with the connective and corrective eye tissues. Um, I've had all sorts of testimonies of people saying that they've had degenerative eye diseases. They had to change the prescription in their eyeglasses. Uh, people with, it helps with glaucoma. Uh, so all sorts of degenerative eye issues. Uh, it helps with like the depth of field. So you'll be able to see things farther and it helps like your eyes will become more vibrant um, after you start using it for a while. Colors will become vibrant. And why one would want to. Yes, on. please, because I'm still stuck on the feeling like you put chili in your eyes. I want to know how, how long does it take for that to dissipate? And then why does somebody use it ongoing? It's really about five, depending. You, you can make it really strong or more mild. The stronger it is, obviously, the more stronger the effects are. Um, anywhere from like 30 seconds to a minute is the burn. And it's really, really worth it because this medicine is absolutely incredible. I've always encouraged people to start working with it in the way of a dieta like just intentionally working with Sananga every day, one drop in each eye. And then as you continue, the burn gets less. You're able to handle it a lot easier because Sananga helps to clear the energy field and really helps with things like lethargy, depression, anxiety. Um, again, also helping to quiet the mind and also, I, whenever I work with Sananga, I feel like this beam of light coming in through my core. And I did a dieta with Sananga and I, I really felt like I turned into a, to a jaguar. Oh. All of these animalistic senses, your extrasensory perceptions. I could hear things like in the next room. Um, my seeing was like just more keen. My psychic ability started coming like I would think I wouldn't even have to pray and sit on my altar and set an intention it was like I would think and all of a sudden it was there like whatever I wanted to manifest it's incredible for manifestation and does it because I'm, I'm actually getting fascinated one of my you know sadnesses I used to have perfect eyesight forever and then um I've been wearing readers now for a while for about 10 years or so. And you know, the more you wear them, the worse your eyes get, the more dependent they get. And I'm, oh, I'm so over it. And I can see they degenerate more and more. And that's typical with age, but God, I would love to have my eyesight back. And I don't know what's possible. I don't know if Sananga, besides all these beautiful spiritual gifts you're talking about, which are very attractive, I don't even know if it could correct that in the field. I can't ever guarantee anything, but I would certainly say, give it a try. Use the full bottle until it's finished and see, try not to use your, your reading glasses. If you, if you can refrain from it, 
because what happens is it, it's like training the eyes to become lazier. And by not using it and just using the sununga, it's it's almost like a muscle you have to exercise within your eyes. If if you can refrain from using your eyeglasses and, and work with sununga, I would really I'll give you your money back. <laughs> <laughs> your eyesight or your money back. Yeah. It's a good deal. Um, cool. And as far as combo, I've not done combo. Um, how much does it hurt to get burned? And then is combo purely a purgative or are there other reasons why people do combo? So combo, no, the burn is like, it just happens for like one second and it, it doesn't, and it leaves a, leaves a tiny little scar. I have them everywhere. You can't really see them. They're small and they eventually go away. Um, combo is also a non-psychoactive medicine and it helps to clear physical blockages and energetic blockages. But combo is really nature's natural vaccine. Incredible for all sorts of immune issues mm. and diseases, cancer, mm. arthritis, um, you know, inflammation in the body. What happens is when combo enters into the bloodstream, the body starts reproducing endogenously. So this is telling us a lot about our own, the chemistry within our own body is that we create the peptides that are also in combo. So our body starts creating um, like 12, 12 is all they've discovered so far. I still think that there is a lot of research that can be done on combo. I'd love to do documentaries. Um, but it, our body starts producing naturally 12 different peptides, incredible peptides for like anti-aging, which is why one of my combo teachers, I have two combo teachers. What my first combo teacher, he was like, I have older women coming to me just for the combo glow to like fill out their wrinkles. I was like, really? That's a thing? That's hilarious. <laughs> okay. Something like the, the new hot thing on the beauty market. <laughs> The new plastic surgery. Yeah. How, how long does combo last? Um, it really depends on how many points you have. I, I, the approach that I work with the medicine is very slow, feminine approach. The indigenous way is a bit more masculine and all at once. Mm. And it's going to be a bit dangerous. I have assisted the indigenous whenever they came over to London. Um, and it was really scary for me to to assist in those ceremonies. I have all the profound love and respect, but I was really scared chillest. <laughs> you know, it was like people would get up to go to the bathroom because if you have four or five points on you all at once, it's like, it's a shock to the system. So people would get up and then all of a sudden they would go, oh, wow. See them conscious and then like gone. Um, so that was always alarming for me. And then when I found, I never thought I would be serving combo because uh, I always had like very strong reactions um, because it wasn't really served to me in the feminine way. And once I received the medicine in the feminine way from my first teacher, I was like, I had a completely different experience. I was like, wow, I really like, I could feel the medicine. I could work with it instead of it being so, such a shock. So I apply the points in a, in a layered approach, very slow, we kind of work in waves and really maybe an hour from like the first point that is on you, anywhere between half an hour or an hour, and then you purge. Naturally, you have to purge. Okay, fascinating. You mentioned the divine feminine. So let's talk about divine feminine healing. How does the feminine need to heal? Um, you're embodied, obviously, in this lifetime in a feminine form, and you've experienced everything from abuse to who you become today. So how do we as females need to heal? How can we embody that healing? Hmm. Beautiful question. I, even though I'm a woman in physical form, I have a lot of masculine energy. Uh, it's also in my, I do something called soul contract reading as well. And it's 
sort of based on Kabbalah and numerology and astrology. Hmm. And within those numbers, I have a lot of masculine numbers, which gives me a lot of power and, and force to do all the missions that I'm that I'm doing. Um, and my soul's destiny is actually to, to come into union, which I feel I'm doing a pretty good job now. But within the feminine, um, ways that we can heal really is, so through my own journey of what I've experienced is that the feminine has learned whether it's been through programming or what we have seen as examples of women really becoming more masculine than men and it's something I've, I've certainly experienced and my teacher even said it to me he's like you're more masculine than some men that I know it's just that like I have a lot of like powerful energy in my numbers and in my in my journey in my life like i my mom raised me really like i've had stepfathers and my my father but they weren't they weren't there and they were abusive so really my mom is the one that has has raised me and because she was doing it alone she had to do it all and there are so many women that i see also my friends who don't have who have you know like children where their fathers have left there's so much wounding um yeah carried within there and like bitterness of having to do it all by ourselves because no one there was no masculine around to pick up the pieces or to like hold the space and to hold that container for for the feminine to do the nurturing we've a lot of a lot of us feminine have had to be the masculine and the feminine so i think that this is also what we're seeing with the rise, if you want to say, the rise of the feminine who are leading powerful places and spaces, you know, like mm -hmm. leader, us feminine leaders um, carrying this masculine and feminine energy. I feel that women really, whether you're masculine or feminine, the best work that we can do is, is inner child work and, and forgiveness and forgiveness of the masculine. And I was just speaking with someone about this yesterday, about forgiveness. And that in my experience in life, that say you have a situation and you're working on forgive forgiveness. Someone has wronged you and hurt you and even abused you. When, like I could take my example of, of being abused. I wouldn't change it for the world. It's shaped me into who I am today and has I've I've allowed myself to empower myself from it by facing it head on by forgiving in a verbal conversation the people who have abused me you know like really facing that fear and now I'm able to just naturally by way of me alchemizing that I help other women transform their own pain and suffering through abuse and that for me is, is like it's one of the greatest gifts to be able to hold a woman in 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 that space and see her transform before my eyes you know where those shackles that bind you are, are no longer there and quite the opposite there she's empowered but the, the one thing that I would like to touch on is that in this conversation I was having that when you see it from a higher perspective of like, yes, forgiveness is an incredible step. But if you want to go a step beyond that, when, and it's, it takes time. It's not the immediate thing that happens. Over time, you can see that like, okay, I forgive this person who has abused me. But then when you really see the dynamic of each person who's played their part, you actually, forgiveness is something that is almost really not even necessary because then it gets transformed into wow thank you for playing the villain or the person like you you know up here in our soul contracts you agreed to come in to abuse me that's actually love so that I could 
give myself the opportunity to rise in my greatness and learn about forgiveness and compassion and have that fuel my life to then be able to help other women heal and transform. That's like the most powerful alchemy you can you can ever harness. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, and I now I understand the connection to when you said you do soul contract work because I've, oh gosh, so long ago, I read this amazing book. I don't remember the gentleman who wrote it, but he was doing work with that and he brought in all these very powerful, um, it was beyond channeling and mediumship. They were extremely gifted, so gifted that they could work with a being, a person like yourself or myself and go and see what happened when the soul made a choice to incarnate into this life, what was the exact precise conversation and with whom about, mm -hmm. here's what I'm gonna need. I, I'm gonna need to be blind in this life and I'm gonna need to learn X, Y, Z. And then this one soul that we've done many lifetimes with and is part of our soul group steps forward and says, well, I'm gonna be, you know, your, your husband who fully accepts you and somebody else, another soul steps forward and says, yeah, I'm going to be somebody who is so bullying to you that you almost have a crisis and you come to a crossroads and have to decide if, you know, where their strength is and you can get strength from this. And I don't want to do that job because that job sucks and it's an ugly character, but I love you so much. I'm going to do that. And so I understand the idea of the villain and it's, um, but that's a lot of work, you know, for some of the big, um, situations. It's something I'm working on right now, frankly, and I'm teeter tottering between the situation and the, um, cause you know, with forgiveness, right? The worst thing is if a person doesn't apologize the worst, like you really have to do the journey on your own. So there's that component. And then there's the component of, um, like you mentioned it earlier, but it is like being Eagle Condor, right? And being able to see from above the beautiful matrix of a situation. And especially as you, I can speak for myself as I am seeing myself shift and I am changing spiritually so much stronger, so much different, different ways of perceiving, thinking. And as that's happening, I am starting to have gratitude mm -hmm. and forgiveness and understanding going, wow, like that, that really is amazing. That whole experience. And I will probably thank you even more in the future, but right now, some of that is happening, but that's, that's a big journey you're talking about. Yeah. It certainly doesn't happen overnight. It sometimes takes years for sure. Yeah. And so when you say that you do the soul contract work, all right, do you have the ability to actually um, go above somebody's soul and be able to see for them? Or how do you facilitate that? This method, whatever you're talking about, sounds really amazing. I'd love to have a session with that. Mm -hmm. um, the method that I use is, so it's taken, it was, it, it's a channeled method by Frank Alper and he channeled the soul of Moses. And so it combines Kabbalah, astrology, some tarot, and numerology. So we, we would take your birth name. It then gets like numerology. So each letter has a vibration, which is a frequency and a number. And those all get placed around your chart, which is in the Merkava. So we've got the feminine principle and then the masculine principle. And then we work around sort of in a spiral on your physical aspects and then your spiritual aspects. You have your number placements in physical and spiritual karma, then physical and spiritual talents, and then physical and spiritual um, talents, gifts. And then in the end, we arrive at your soul's destiny, but it's not like, oh, your soul's destiny is to be like a world famous radio host. <laughs> it's, it's very grounded and practical about, um, like for me, it's because I have so many masculine numbers in my chart, it's a challenge for me to really, you know, be in full alignment with my masculine and feminine energies. 
And that's that's a full like journey. You don't learn that from beginning to end. But it's great because you you have your karmic aspects are the most like hardcore ones to work through. And then your gifts in the middle are like the fulcrum points that will help you pivot into your into your evolution of where your your soul's destiny is meant to be. And then on the subject of black magic entities, <laughs> implants, I'm learning that right now in shaman school. So that's really interesting doing extractions. I don't know what you're doing, but what's your experience in the dark arts? Um, how'd you get there? How have you been challenged by dark energies? In lots of various different ways to my own, a, a lot of weird ET experiences. Um, but yeah, I would definitely say I've been tra trained in the dark arts from having a lot of abuse, um, abusive relationships. And the methods that I use, so I rec I've recognized within my own life experience that those experiences, whether it was, I've also had lots of like shamanic wars with, and because I'm an energy worker, I recognize when something is, it's like a little radar in the field, you know, and then I go in and I check who it's from and it's like, oh, it's from this person. And I've had, I won't name names, but yeah, some fairly well-known shaman who've been sending me um, black magic and also other people who are supposed to be in the light. Um, I would definitely say that they're false light workers if, if they're sending me black magic, you know? Um, so these people, when this happens, I always share that like, it's an initiation. If someone is sending you black magic and you're here to like really learn and grow from everything in this human experience. I've been, I've been sent black magic a lot and for a really long time, long period, really when I started entering into shamanism. Um, and to be honest, it's something that for me, I've sat with like, really, come on, you know, it's like gum in my hair. I know how to get rid of it. It's like, it's annoying and it's childish. It's so low vibration. Like, why can't we just celebrate and uplift one another? So in various different methods of training for me i've learned extraction methods whether it's through you use agua florida and the crystal and you can suck them out i don't like to do this method anymore um because i'm an energy worker i can really i can just clear them with my hands um and my my intention and i've also like I, because i've worked for so many years and also with my energy mentors and my energy energy mentor teachers i have very specific things in my field that I can just by the power of intention now, because it's also like a muscle that I've been using for so long, I just have to intend it and then it happens. So I've got like a generator in the, like a backpack back here that sometimes if I go over to people's houses and there's like low vibrational spirits or energies, I'll just start yawning. Whereas sometimes like if I yawn really like, oh, like a hungry hippo, <laughs> whoa, what do you have in the house? <laughs> That's hilarious. But I'm grateful for all of those hardcore experiences that they've helped empower me. Yeah. And people don't realize, you know, if you're just around somebody who's angry with you and throwing anger and resentment at you with childhood, <clears throat> whether you're in school, whether you're in a relationship with somebody, family or otherwise, and it's just, you know, yeah that stuff it not for everybody your luminous energy field can actually repel it it can be that healthy but also mm -hmm. for uh, it also at, at times can get embedded and crystallized so that's one thing and then there's you know fluid dark energies that get entrapped and that can be from any lifetime or this lifetime and you know it's good to have somebody who can do it i my little toolbox i've got a double-sided vogel i've mm -hmm. got a excuse me, double tipped Vogel crystal, yep. it's 13 sided. And I use that. And then of course I clean it. Um, and I know I've been trained never to suck it. Never like, don't do that because it's, you know, you can get so ill from ingesting that. And I know a lot of um, indigenous people who do that and they throw up and, you know, to get it out of their system. But, you know, when you've got a crystal, and you can, like you said, use your hands, use energy. I mean, energy is everything. You can actually locate 
move, shift, extract things. It has to be done right. There's a protocol. But when it's done correctly uh, with harm to none, and it can be so freeing. Yeah. I've had many done for me and it's life changing. Yeah, it certainly is. And it doesn't, I think we've been conditioned to think, I don't know whether it's like we've all, because we've all seen the exorcist. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what it's supposed to look like when you're having like an entity removal. It's not like, it doesn't go down like that for me at all. It's actually very peaceful, very loving. We just release them into the light. You know, it's like, it's not, it's not any drama. I had a woman who wanted to do, she wanted me to be on a TV show and I declined because, you know, TV shows, they have to sell drama. And it was like the way that she was, they were programming it was a lot of drama. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to but my work is just not that way. It's it's light mm. and it's love and it's and it's easy. Yes, it's not it's not all love, light, and butterflies for sure. It's not light language. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Sandra, here we are at the end. I've totally enjoyed this. People can find you at tribu.com, tribu.com? Tribu Spirit. Tribu Spirit. Dot com and the other website is your last name h y r e higher consciousness dot com and Chandra what are you next dare to dream what are your future dreams and your visions wow I've accomplished so much in this year already and it's not even finished um, my next sort of goal is to start working on sound healing courses. <laughs> And that's the baby step. And I'm going to, I'm going to really start um, educating and teaching. So it's kind of like a shamanic school, just really carrying on all the, all the knowledge that I, that I have. I want to time to pass it off now and, and to share it. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show and thank you for the amazing work you do. Thank you so much, sister. It's been really a joy. So I feel like we we were so deep in, in many different dimensions and places that it happened, yeah, like in the blink of an eye and I'm surprised it's an hour already. Thank you so much for all the beautiful work that you do and I'd love to stay in touch and yeah, definitely have you doula my, my, birth, my book about the auroras. Excellent. And I can't wait to learn more about that. I'm fascinated by that and the auroras. And thank you for trusting me and this platform and coming out galactically on this show in such a safe space and to be embraced by this spiritual tribe. And they know exactly what you're talking about and that you're one of us. So thanks for being the emissary that you are. Thank you, sister. Lots of love. Lots, Lots of love. Me. Yes. And I end today's show with this quote from Gerard Armand Powell from Rhythmia. I was afraid that after drinking ayahuasca and experiencing death, that I would get reckless and careless, but the exact opposite happens. It appears that death is what gives life its meaning. When we do plant medicine and we see love, we realize right then and there that love was never apart from us, that in fact, it was a part of us. All disease, disorder and addictions stem from the yearning to reunite with one's soul. The key to all of your behaviors is hidden in a box that you can't open using normal tools. Your subconscious needs a different recipe than the one you've been using. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. If you're listening to the podcast, join me on YouTube so you can watch us at youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment, share. Next week on the show, I am featuring the amazing Amira Hall, who's an internationally renowned clairvoyant energy healer, matrix energetic practitioner, and a Reiki master. Thank you for joining us on Dare to Dream today. And remember, turn all your dreams into your realities.